You know, to your point of the, how many engineers were graduating, my PhD is in mechanical engineering, and which is kind of strange because I came to it late and my bachelor's and master's are in math and computer science, but because in high school I had calculus and physics mm -hmm. and those kind of things and chemistry, I could get into the math and I could carry all of that later on into engineering. If you're getting a bachelor's in engineering, you can't even think about it unless you've had calculus and right. chemistry and, and physics in high school. So you're already out. Mm -hmm. And then we wash out 40% of our engineers as if mm -hmm. we want to do that. It's like, if you want to be an engineer, hang in there and be an engineer. Why are we washing you out? And I walk around to people. I, I work with a lot of universities, from Stanford to Purdue to MIT. And I talk to them and I say, hey, you got any minors in engineering? And they go, well, we can't have minors in engineering. It's like, why can't we have minors in engineering? Why can't we have people go from, from one science to another science to an engineering to a law to wherever they want right, to go? Because right. we're all saying to each other, the most interesting things are happening between classic topics, mm -hmm. between classic Absolutely. arenas. Absolutely. And these are things that we need to educate yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. Oh, let me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try mine. I just wanted to come back to one thing that Barbara said about elementary school and the emphasis on reading. There's a sort of a well-kept secret, even though uh, in 2010 we had a whole issue of Science Magazine focused on this issue of the connection from scientific studies of what happens in schools between doing the right kind of science education, that is, that's active learning, which involves you know, a lot of communication skills, writing, reading, and so on. The connection between doing that kind of science and actually succeeding in the things that are reading and writing and literacy, uh, in fact, it's a powerful way for kids, especially from these underprivileged backgrounds, to get, first of all, motivated in school. Uh, you know, it's just nor normal. You think of yourself. If you come to school and, you're, and you, you haven't had the parental I look at my grandkids when they come to school, they've already had so much education from being founded by their parents. Uh, if you haven't had that, obviously you're going to be in the bottom quarter of your class, the bottom half of your class. You're not going to be doing well. And there's it's nothing motivating about school if you're always behind and always doing poorly. But what, what happens when you uh, set up these active learning kindergartens or first grades, uh, many of these kids who don't read very well haven't had that background. They're actually quite gifted in setting up apparatus and working with their hands. And that gives them the po kind of positive feedback in their interaction with their peers that they, they need to, to actually l learn other skills. And for whatever reason, studies show that that kind of uh, combination of hands-on science, inquiry science with reading and writing t about what you're doing in science class is an is a, a incredibly powerful way to uh, get kids to, uh, to actually be effective learners in school and, and do well in reading and writing. Uh, so my dream is, uh, I've been talking about this, this with the superintendent of schools of San Francisco for three years. We always say, oh yeah, this is a good idea. We haven't yet been able to do it. Is it they have all these schools that have been failing forever in parts of town which have you know, difficult environments for kids. And they keep on, uh, under the new, uh, you know, punishment for no child left behind, they, they take away everything but reading and writing and math and they give them double periods of drill and not, you know, now the kids don't even come to school. All so. children left behind. <laughs> <laughs> now, all cool. children, now all children are left behind or demoralized anyway. But I, I would like to take two of those schools with a, a matching two schools and the district could do whatever their new deal is, the, the newest hot thing to get these kids to be able to, to learn effectively on two of the schools and for the other two we'd make them science-based schools. Where we'd start with this hands-on science and in fact uh, th there are programs that developed that actually in Berkeley and Lawrence Hall that focus on the connections between doing this science and reading and writing and uh, put that kind of curriculum in that school and, and if we could actually do an experiment for five years and see what actually happens so that as they move through school. I, I'm sure we could be very effective with these kids. We were just discussing before the meeting, uh, why can't California do experiments? Uh, uh, SRI is apparently doing experiments in many other states, uh, some of the probably of this kind, but California seems to have all these state burden rules that make it 
impossible to do creative things. Uh, and I read a paper uh, maybe three or four years ago that analyzed why that's, why is California so top heavy hierarchical in this education system? And it was all traced back to Proposition 13. When Proposition 13 uh, was passed, the, the schools were no longer supported by local property tax. Now the state took over. And as everybody knows, when, when the state starts paying, they start commanding. And so we have, uh, you know, Proposition 13 has been a disaster for California in many ways. It started our real decline. But I had never realized that part of the problem was not only the money, but the the sort of top-down management that we now have that is a straitjacket for anybody wanting to do creative things in education in California.